Hello and welcome to a new special edition of the Hod Dibbin Adventures uh, through time, satanic adventures. <laughs> it's silly. Um, that I read through the Hod Dibbin articles from 1961 that he put out in September, I think it is, of 1961. He puts out three articles that kind of seed in a satanic panic narrative. Um, and they're very interesting articles. Um, Hod Dibbin himself is a very interesting man. And we're going to see the third of these. So if you haven't caught the first two, you might want to, because yeah, as a small recap, Hod Dibbin is in a village of Twat, which is <laughs> spelled T-W-A-T-T, on the Orkney Isles, uh, serving during the war. And he gets given, uh, he, get, he finds a nest with eggs in and a business with eggs in at the end of his bed one day and they have nazi swastikas drawn in blood but then they disappear and then the satanists turn up cicera and all of this so i hope you have fun with this i'm having fun with this i will share my screen for you all right now and this article this is a 17th of september 1961 in the people newspaper the article is called i flee from the vengeance of satan's brotherhood oh, it's hard to see so i flee from the vengeance of satan's brotherhood and as you see it's a two-page double bill this picture here says paris salon clothes and exclusive education Hod Dibbin lavished everything on Patsy, the grocer's daughter, whom he wanted to shape into the perfect woman. So this is his first Pygmalion girl and how she gets taken by the devil himself. And there you go, Hod Dibbin's face looking worried and concerned, floating there. This house over here, to light's scary house with its private chapel, went Hod Dibbin to seek meditation and peace from its ill tormentors, from his ill tormentors. Instead, the old house brought him new terror. And this house is quite a big house um, that he was managing, in charge of, maybe owning, but he owned it through two bankruptcies, so I get a feeling he was doing a lot of dodgy stuff with Hod Dibbin. Let's get into it. Hod Dibbin, the man who for years reveled in the vile orgies of black magic, Tells of his horror when he discovers the house he thought he could hide in is haunted. I lay in my four-poster bed trembling with fear. Once more I could hear the noise, a tapping on the window pane, followed by a faint, strangled cry. <coughs> with the beads of sweat gathering on my forehead, I climbed out of bed, walked to the window, and drew back the curtains. There was a swift movement on the windowsill, and I saw a figure wearing a long nightshirt clinging desperately to the ledge to save himself from falling. With my trembling fingers, I fumbled to open the window to save him. Before I could do so, before I could do so, he fell with a scream into the courtyard below. I watched, terror-stricken, as his body struck the frost-covered ground. Barefoot, I raced downstairs and outside to where the body had fallen. There was no trace of it. It was my first night at Light's Carey, a fine 15th century house I had rented near Bath. I had taken the place, hoping to escape from the persecution of vengeance, which had followed me ever since my ruination, uh, my renunciation, sorry, of the Brotherhood of Satan, the evil black magic circle to which I once belonged. For two years, as a member of the circle, I had indulged in every kind of wickedness and obscenity. I vowed to Satan to cast aside purity and goodness and to indulge in evil lust. I reveled in ritual and ceremonies that were little more than wild orgies of licentiousness. At last, I was jolted to my senses by a particularly loathsome ceremony, the ritual of the goat and the girl which I witnessed one moonlight night on the hillside in the Orkneys. Disgusted to the point of nausea, I made up my mind there and then to turn my back forever on the horrible cult of black magic and everyone connected with it. But it was not as easy as that. 
the leaders of the Brotherhood do not lightly watch one of their brethren desert the cult. Mediation. At once, they began campaign of terror and revenge against me, even hundreds of miles away from Orkneys, where I had joined in their evil practices. I walked in fear of my life. It was in an effort to escape from my tormentors that I moved to the seclusion of Light's Carey, an old house in a beautiful park with an ancient ta- chapel in which I could meditate and pray and cleanse my soul of the evil that had fouled it. But my experience on that first night there showed me without doubt that I was still not to be left alone. I was convinced that it was a live human figure I had seen fall from the window ledge. I was quite sure it was not the product of an overwrought imagination. For the rest of that night, I sought sanctuary in my private chapel. Only there could I feel safe. As the light of the dawn filtered through the chapel's stained glass windows, I ventured out to examine the spot where I'd seen the body fall. The ground was damp with dew, but there was one dry pinch in the outline of a cross. I recoiled in horror. It was still more evidence of a supernatural evil agency at work. The insistent plaguing by my persecutors had brought me to the state of mind where I was convinced of that. Panic-stricken, I hurriedly packed some clothes into a suitcase and drove to London. For several days, I stayed in a hotel in a state of fear. I was afraid even to cross a road in case my tormentors from the Brotherhood of Satan should try again to kill me in an accident as they had tried before. A few days later, I heard that my son Michael intended visiting me at Light's Carey. I decided to return and carefully watch his reaction to the place. When Michael arrived, he was enchanted. This is magnificent. How I would like to live here, he said. I said nothing about my experience. We had dinner and then a few drinks in the drawing room before retiring for the night. By an odd mistake, Michael walked without hesitation into my own bedroom, thinking that's where he was to sleep. So I turned into the room that had really been prepared for him. But I could not sleep. I lay awake, expecting to hear a call from him, for I was convinced that room was haunted. Ghost curtains. At last dawn came and my anxiety subsided. There had been no sound from my room. Obviously, Michael had slept well. I began to tell myself that the whole incident of the falling body must have been my imagination. As the clock chimed eight, I went to wish Michael good morning, but I was walking down the corridor when he burst out his door, white-faced. Come to my room at once, father, he gasped. I followed him in as he went straight over to the window, threw it wide open and held up his handkerchief to flutter in the stiff breeze blowing it. I stared at him, puzzled. The curtains, father, he blurted out. Why aren't the curtains moving? He was right. The flimsy cotton curtains remained completely motionless. I dashed into the next room and flung open the window, and at once the curtains billowed out in the breeze. There's something queer about that room, said Michael. I'll never go in there again. He left the room at once. I stood there half afraid, knowing that Michael was right. There was no explaining the phenomenon. A few weeks later, I obtained final proof that my son and I could not have fallen victims to our imagination. It was when my friend, Mr. Reginald Warner, one of London's best-known art connoisseurs, came to spend the weekend with me at Light's Carey. By an uncanny coincidence, Reggie also went unbidden straight into the haunted room. Michael and I sat downstairs a while, convinced um, we would soon hear a cry from Reggie. After an hour or so without incidents, we went to our rooms. Two hours later, I was awakened by shouts. Bop, 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 bop. Flinging on a dressing gown, I dashed downstairs. Reggie was stretched out unconscious on the floor, with blood pouring from his... Ooh, where was the blood pouring from? <laughs> I always like these gaps. With blood pouring from his face. Hmm. Michael was standing over him saying, Reggie, Reggie, tell us what happened. After a few minutes, Reggie's eyes flickered open. It was the hand, 
he said, it was the hand. As he regained consciousness, consciousness, he told us he had heard a scratching noise outside the bedroom window. He opened to investigate. Fiendish claws. At once, a huge hand with claw-like nails struck at him from the darkness, staring at his face. I remember no more after that, he said. I searched the room, but could find nothing to explain the vicious attack on Reggie. A cat? There was not one in the neighbourhood. Reggie caught the next train back to London, vowing never to return. I too made a decision. I also would leave lights carry. It was my only chance to escape the evil powers that I was convinced possessed it. There was only one problem. Patsy Morgan, the girl who helped me in my antique business and on whom I had come to look on, look as a daughter. He's about to talk about Patsy Morgan being his daughter. And may I just say that Patsy Morgan Dibbin used to have sex with men while he watched. Also, she was about uh, between the ages of 12 and 16 when he first took her in as his Pygmalion girl. There was only one problem. Patsy Morgan, the girl who helped me in my antiques business and whom I had come to look as a daughter. Several years before I had become her legal guardian in order to give her, the daughter of a Southampton grocer, a better chance in life. She looked upon me as a father. Indeed, she had taken my name and was now known as Patsy Morgan Dibbin. But I knew it would be unfair to ask her to come to London with me. So I decided to be frank and confess to her the terrible secret of my life of black magic and the forces of vengeance that were pursuing me. With deep understanding, Patsy listened to me and finally gave her decision. Yes, she would help me to start life anew, and she promised her unswerving devotion to my struggle to escape evil. We set up a home in the fashionable Eaton Place, London. Our flat was luxuriously furnished, and on Patsy, in returning for her understanding, I lavished my heartfelt devotion. It has been said that I was her Pygmalion. It is certainly true that I wanted to shape her into my image of the perfect woman, just like the girl in Shaw's play. Already endowed with great beauty and grace, she was the mould into which I was prepared to pour every penny I owned. Her clothes came from the most expensive couturiers of Paris. She was tutored in foreign languages and the social graces. She travelled extensively and in the end became the toast of, the, of five countries. I gave my permission for her to run Knightsbridge Club, Esmeralda's Barn, in which my great friend, the late motor ace, the Marquis of Portago, had a share. Evil omen. As her star soared, peace of mind came to me for the first time for many years. Regularly I attended church, daily I studied the scriptures and prayed. Gradually the black despair of my past receded. After years of fear, I could at last walk in the sunshine with a song in my heart. Then suddenly, my peace of mind was shattered by another sinister, tragic incident. It began with what seemed like an everyday household mishap. I accidentally knocked onto the floor a small framed portrait, and the glass broke. The portrait was of a girl called Betty, whom I had known many years before, and whom I had confided the secrets of my black magic experiences. As I looked at the shattered glass, a dreadful, uncanny feeling came over me that this was an omen. Was she to be punished for unwittingly helping me break faith with the Brotherhood? I could not erase the thought from my mind. I knew she was safe in Italy with her husband, but I could not forget the grim forecast made years before by Cicera, a black magic high priestess, of what would happen if I did betray the circle. Premonition. She foretold business disasters, the sudden death of my father, my banishment from his will, the death of a great friend in a car crash, and desertion by a person who I was devoted. The first three of those warnings had already been uncannily fulfilled, was the evil hand of the Brotherhood about to strike its next sinister blow. I began to have an awful premonition that something terrible was to it was going to happen to Betty. I could not sleep that night. It so happened that I had some business in Italy that week, so I made a point of visiting Betty and her husband. I found them in the best of health and spirits. 
I thought of warning them about my premonitions, but in the sunshine and gaiety of Italy, it seemed ridiculous that anything could happen to them. So I completed my business and flew back to London. On arrival at London Airport, I bought an evening paper, and the first thing I saw was news that Betty had been killed that very morning in a car crash. The fourth of the high priestess's predictions had been fulfilled, and soon followed the fifth, the desertion by one to whom I was devoted. The uncanny way in which my dear Patsy was spirited away from me was perhaps the most sinister of all the Brotherhood's acts of revenge. I'll tell you about that next week. He tried to atone by giving this girl a chance in life, but an evil prophecy is fulfilled. Again, if you've read uh, the third article in the Black Hand series, you will know Patsy Morgan Dibbin. Uh, disappears and loads of excuses are made for her disappearances. She's in uh, France with an earl. She's in Italy with an earl. She's um, uh, gonna jump out of a plane with uh, a commander, um, an ex parachute guy, over the North Pole. Be the first people to ever do that. She's going to do this. She's going to do that. And basically, she disappeared, and loads of excuses were made for her. And this is another excuse. In 1961, he's still saying that Patsy Morgan Dibbin was taken by Satan now. Of course, um, there's rumors about her, and Lillian Pizzicini writes about her, um, but uh, it's all through second-hand information of people who have also been trying to see the information that she didn't die at some point because I think, I, I don't think she's, she was around, but that's my own personal opinion. I haven't got enough evidence for that. So I like looking at some of these papers. Uh, this is the article, is hard. And of course it's called I Flee from the Vengeance of Satan's Brotherhood. And it's a very interesting article and that's the fourth of them. Now his plastered past is behind him. True Jow, the invisible hairdressing. I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? I'm not sure you do. So, that was the third part of Hod Dibbin's uh, Satanic Adventures. And um, the last part I'll bring out very soon. These will all be up on Johnny Vedmore YouTube and Fungi Monkey as separate pieces eventually. Um, so that people can enjoy them, <laughs> and I do have other plans. Um, with Hod Dibbin, and we're currently um uh, uh still going through the Black Hand series. So, as I record this now, uh, you've got uh number five is coming out about next week, maybe this week. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows these things? But it's ready. It's ready to go out along with a news hound. Um, and so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, adventures through space and time on Newshound. Um, and uh, please, please take care of yourselves. For now, bye. Young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina, and so on, certainly penetrates the cabinets.